There is a sixth dimension beyond that which is known to men. It is a dimension as immense as the sky and as perpetual as eternity. It is the middle ground between illumination and darkness, between knowledge and ignorance. It lies between the depths of man's horror and the apex of his learning. This is a dimension of fantasy. It is an area which we call the creepy zone. What kind of world are we going to live in when we get our permanent furloughs? Super speed highways? Plastic packards? Streamlined cities? What does the future hold in store for us? To get a glimpse of that future, Army Navy Screen Magazine presents a new department. Tomorrow, previewing our post-war world, the job opportunities the new fields ahead. For the first in our Tomorrow series, let's look into a brand new development. Television, here's an expert with a lowdown on the inside facts. Dr. Orestes Caldwell, editor of Electronic Industries and former member of the Federal Communications Commission. I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to you men and women in the service of America. I believe in this world to come. I think it's going to be a pretty good world. But I've been asked to tell you about television, so I'll trim the philosophizing. Television is most certainly here to stay. It's going to brighten the world of your home. But more important to many of you, it's going to create a lot of new jobs. Now, none of us like crystal gazing, so let's take a look at what is actually happening now. Nine experimental telecasting studios are already operating with pre-war equipment and skeleton staffs. While the electronic industry is busy finishing its war job, a handful of people, girls, ex-vets, older men, are keeping the television field alive, experimenting, ironing out kinks, but proving that television will definitely be part of American life when the go-ahead comes. Sight teamed up with sound to bring the world to your easy chair. Telecasting studios will be a combination of Broadway and Hollywood, and you'll get the best of both for the price of your television set and a few cents worth of electricity. And outside the studios, mobile televising units, portable stations on wheels, are now experimenting with remote pickups, getting primed to bring you on-the-spot news and history in the making. When television networks are formed, you will have a direct wire to every place a television camera can be set up. A world of sports at your fingertips. They're off. That's interpreter number two right in front. And the field races past the stand with interpreter on top. No man in second place moving up on the outside. Mayor LaGuardia pitches the first ball. Red Ruffing is taking his time. And it's a hit. There's a capacity crowd here at Madison Square Garden tonight to witness the semifinals of the Golden Glove. Telecasting is done on a limited schedule now. But tomorrow, you will have a permanent ringside seat everywhere from Madison Square Garden to the House of Congress. You'll see transmitted by television, newsreels, and super Hollywood productions. Plays and musicals. Command performances in your own living room. These men at Howard General Hospital, where there are a hundred sets, 
can tell you television is here to stay. Even now, without the technical improvements that will come after the war, the television picture has the quality of a good home movie. The pre-war models in use today have a small screen, but here's a practical working model with a 16 by 22 inch screen that goes into production just about the time you're being measured for civvies. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. WNBT, New York. Well, that gives you a pretty general idea of what's happening. Now let's see how television works. You're going to find a new type of aerial against the skyline of America when you return. It will be up high because television waves, like light rays, don't bend and are stopped by the horizon. So the higher the aerial, the farther the waves travel. But first, what is a television wave? As you know, all objects reflect light, some more, some less, depending on their color. The white jacket of these fencers is reflecting more light than their dark trousers. The television camera lens, like an ordinary camera, picks up these differences in light and shadow. Only instead of film behind the lens, we have the iconoscope, familiarly known as Ike. The camera plate of the iconoscope is made up of millions of sensitive electric eyes. These eyes pick up electric impulses from the object being televised and form a picture which is then transmitted as separate electric impulses from the camera plate to the receiver screen. There the impulses are converted back to pinpoints of light and shadow to reform the picture on the screen. Here, the process is slowed down for you. Actually, the impulses travel from the camera to the receiving set at the rate of four million impulses a second, forming the picture in motion. Fantastic. But our children will grow up with this miracle enriching their lives and giving them a new understanding of the whole world. Gosh. By harnessing electrons and vacuum tubes, our research scientists backed by American industry and manufacturing skill, have developed this new means of communication to the point where it promises to become a post-war billion dollar industry which can serve our nation and the world in new and wonderful ways. Let's listen to a man who knows. He is one of the great leaders in the world of electronics, Brigadier General Sarnoff, president of the Radio Corporation of America. When the first world war ended, it was my good fortune and privilege to play a part in the launching and subsequent development of a new industry called broadcasting. There were some who said it had great promise. There were others who said that it was a noisy, sputtering gadget, a passing fancy. The rest, you know. Now let us see what possibilities exist for television once the war ends. Here are the possibilities. In the manufacturing field, 60,000 men and women will be needed to make the first sets, which will retail for about $200, with 18 million Americans ready to buy them. Help wanted. Electronic experts, assemblers, wiremen, machinists, finishers, testing personnel, sheet metal workers, drill press operators, spot welders. Television is just made to order for GIs with radio and radar experience. 85,000 maintenance men are going to be needed to install and service the 30 million sets expected to be sold within the first 10 years of full-scale production. And in the distribution end of the business, 135,000 jobs are going to open up in the new shops and sales organizations that will supply the huge consumer demand. All in all, 300,000 well-paying jobs are expected to be created by television within five years after the new industry really gets rolling. Well, that's a comprehensive view of the industrial picture. Now what about television production? Here's a man who qualifies as an expert on that subject. Meet Mr. Gilbert Seldes, head of production of the Columbia Broadcasting System. They tell me that a great many of you may be interested in jobs in television production. 
But I think you're entitled to the hard, solid facts in the case. As of spring 1945, we are employing 62 people. They worked a full week to put on four hours of programs on the air. That doesn't mean four hours a day, it means four hours a week. If we were on the air eight hours a day, seven days a week, we'd need at least seven times as many people in the neighborhood of 500. And we're only one studio. There are 900 radio broadcasting stations in the United States today. And it's anybody's guess how many television stations are going to spring up. We can just be sure that the faster we deliver good entertainment and good pictures, the more jobs we're going to create. And there will be a lot of jobs. You compare television with radio, for instance. Here is a radio newscaster on the air. One man in the studio, one in the control room. And here is a television newscast. And a lot of work went into it before it got this far. Now as for the movies. Here is just a medium colossal production underway. Yes, it takes a lot of people and many months to make one. Yet commercial television will probably use more material in one week than all the studios in Hollywood turn out in a year. And finally, in the theater, you produce a show that may run for years. In television, every night is opening night and closing night, too. Now let's look at some specific television jobs. Some of them you'll see come from radio, movies, and the theater. Some are new. Here are two men doing a job never heard of before. They are riding the Ike. Shaders and switchers in the control room see that the pictures come out right. At the transmitter, they see that they get out on the air. And electronic experts keep it all functioning. You men with radio and radar training are only a hop, skip, and jump from the industry's needs. Then there will be modifications of established professions. Writers, directors, producers, scenic designers, and just to show you wax waves and spars that this isn't exclusively a man's world, there'll be costume designing and stage management. And behind the scenes, makeup, props, electricians, and almost everything else from carpenters to model makers. But the great thing to remember is that we've just begun to discover the possibilities of television. And these are only a few of the jobs that already exist. Many more are bound to develop as we go on. That's it television and some interesting jobs which some of you may be qualified for but more than that television can be the window to the whole world a medium through which the united nations can better understand each other and live together in the world of tomorrow Say your line. No. Nope. Say it. Don't forget. Don't. Say it. Mike, don't. Say it. Don't forget you to watch break. Mary Shelley Hall. Hall. I break, break it. Break it. Do you... Say don't it. Forget break it. Break don't forget to watch it. Break it. Don't forget to watch it. Don't forget to watch it. Break it. Break it. Break it. Break it. Break it. Break The interesting thing about Tomorrowland is that it's an intriguing idea and it's connected with Disney in a, in a really interesting way. In our modern world, everywhere we look, we see the influence science has on our daily lives. Many of the things that seem impossible now will become realities tomorrow. Walt Disney was really interested in the future and all the possibility it could bring. It completely and totally fired up his creative imagination. A beautiful tomorrow just to dream away. That says we're going places. There's progress ahead. A lot of this circles around who Walt Disney really was. He looked at the future with some idea that there's some hope and some positive outcome. He came up with systems that would make people work together better, optimizing the human race. Walt Disney was always playing with something, you know, whether it was animatronics or mass transportation, the monorail, urban planning, too, is his idea of what the world could be like. Experimental prototype community of tomorrow. I think he thought the best way to do that was not to preach about it, but to do it. There's a lot of similarities between the last project he was working on, the Epcot Center, and Tomorrowland, which was this utopian version of what 
we at our best could be. Since I was a little kid, Tomorrowland has not always felt traditionally science fiction to me. It's almost felt like science fact. Some of these things haven't happened yet, but they can happen. Buckle up! And I think that the great thing about Walt is he inspired us to light that spark of optimism. We're getting a large canvas to paint on because the very word Tomorrowland is evocative. It evokes play and it evokes promise, freshness, you know, something that's unknown that's about to be here. A place where people actually live a life they can't find anywhere else in the world. Rated PG. You wanted to see Tomorrowland. Here it comes. Some of the most famous fashion designers in the U.S. today have been asked to forecast what Eve will look like in A.D. 2000. One idea is a dress that can be adapted for morning, afternoon or evening. It's the sleeves, what does it? Apparently in A.D. 2000 we shall be having a hair-raising time. Yet another designer goes so far as to believe that skirts will disappear entirely. Shoes will have cantilever heels and an electric belt will adapt the body to climatic changes. The lightly clad woman of tomorrow, ooh, swish, will move in an atmosphere that's scientifically kept at the right temperature. The future bride in a wedding dress of glass. What the groom will wear, apart from a worried look, isn't mentioned. A dress of aluminium, with a sash to change it for afternoon or evening, and an electric headlight to help her to find an honest man. As for him, if he matters at all, he'll be fitted with a telephone, a radio, and containers for coins, keys, and candy for cuties. No one can clearly foresee the city of the future, but the appearance of any city of any period of history is a direct outcome of the social, economic, and technical conditions then existing. The cities of the future would be laid out to a master plan. Streets and buildings no longer haphazard, but harmoniously related. Structural ingenuity would, of course, go on producing unusual forms, perhaps suspension bridge apartment houses. These would surely provide wide vistas for the bridge dwellers and perhaps gratify the very human desire for novelty and romance. There must be broad avenues, providing trees and ease of movement, with light and pure air for all buildings. 
Perhaps the master stroke of planning would be to segregate on one hand future highly efficient automatic industrial centers producing all our needed goods and distributing them in abundance. New centers of leisure would arise around which we would live fully participating in the sports, the arts and the sciences, in fact in all the activities which make life worth living. Here's a peep through a future window of the world. This monster plane will carry 600 passengers and a huge wing and double fuselage houses luxurious lounges and reading rooms. It will speed from London to New York in a day. Future aerodromes will be centers for highway, skyle and rail carriers. Landing on top of the huge aerodrome, planes will taxi to a ramp, descend to a lower level and discharge their passengers. At still lower levels, motor highways, railroads and pneumatic mail tubes will have terminals. Here's a ship which has the streamlined form which ocean liners of the future may take. The streamlining is the shape of an object so that it will cause the minimum turbulence of the air passing round. The porpoise, one of the fastest things that swims, is a splendid example of nature's streamline. The body, the fins and tail are all curved and have their blunt ends tapering towards the rear. In designing this ship, the streamline principle has been applied to the entire superstructure. This rounded, unbroken surface from stem to stern not only reduces wind resistance, but also lessens the water that comes over the bow and stern in heavy weather. The part of a conventional liner above the water line is about as large as a solid block of seven storied buildings. 900 feet long and 100 feet wide. Tremendous power is required to move this immense mass over 25 miles an hour. Projections like the bridge, deck and lifeboats disturb the flow of air as the ship passes through it, setting up turbulences which reduce the ship's efficiency. This model of an ocean-going yacht is based on streamlined principles. The deck coverings can be rolled back in fair weather. In the future will no doubt to see streamlined ships which will be faster, more comfortable, and safer than anything we know today. Well, a beautiful tomorrow just to dream away. That says we're going places. There's progress ahead. like myself, is not an optimist, but an optimal behaviorist, which means that every day of your life, if you behave well, you begin to feel well, huh? So that's not false, that's real. You get your work done every day, and at the end of the week, a month, a year, you turn around and say, hey, look what I did. So you feel good. That's real optimism. Tomorrow Land. thought when I was a child that someone should build a permanent world's fair and improve our minds and educate us to dreams
constantly, day after day, for a lifetime. And that's what Disney did. Wow, it looks like it's really coming towards me. Get out of here! This is mine! Go! Hi! Zombie cheerleader here, asking you to watch Sally's Poetry Corners, the first 3D horror poetry corner on YouTube. And I do it! And it has great poems about me and 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 horror and other horror hosts and it's it's really really cool. So go watch Sally's Poetry Corner. You can find it on my YouTube page and it's like right there. You can see it. Anyway, watch out Sally's Poetry Corner in 3D. It's coming for you. It looks like it's coming for you. It's really get out of here. Go away. Every second that ticks by, the future is running out. Newton? That's not mine. What's not yours? The pen. I've never... <laughs> what if there was a place? Dad, I just need you to look at this. Does it look weird? A secret place. Nothing was impossible. You're not saying this! Casey, stop it! Go away! <laughs> Did you see the dog? Oh, cool. <laughs> I want you to take me there. Take you where? Where'd you get this? Who are you, kid? What you saw was a place where the best and the brightest people of the world came together to actually change it. We've been looking for someone like you for a very long time. Why? Did something happen over there? Something bad? They followed you here? Who? Come on! Get in! How is this a good idea? One way in. They know we're coming, so follow me. Of all the people, why me? He thinks you can fix the future. to see tomorrow land here it comes Hit Parader Magazine, your backstage pass into the world of rock and roll. Each month, Hit Parader takes you behind the scenes, traveling into the recording studio with Def Leppard and on the road with Ozzy Osbourne. Hit Parader's exclusive interviews, dynamic color photos, and special features like heavy metal happenings are better than a front row seat at the hottest show in town. Subscribe to Hit Parader, America's number one heavy metal magazine, with a special six-month introductory offer. Call 1-800-ROCKBOX now. I'm Robin Grave. I'm Marlene at Midnight. I'm Halloween Jack. I'm Halloween Jacqueline. And, and you're, you're watching, watching the Monster Channel. <laughs> Watch me on the creepy castle.